Hi guys! This video is about stress fractures in runners specifically and the risk factors for getting those. I was going to include um, treatment for it but then I realized that you know what the treatment for each specific stress fracture can be quite different so I'll rather make videos in the future about how to treat various stress fractures in various parts of the body. So for this one we're going to look at the main risk factors and I know it's, a, it's for runners mainly but it really applies to any sport. So my name is Mareka for those of you who don't know me. I'm the physiotherapist at sportsinjuryphysio.com where you can get online physiotherapy assessment as well as treatment for your injuries. Have a look at the description of this video if you want um, a link to my website. Good, so risk factors. We've got two, four, six, seven of them actually. By far the most important one, or I would say 50-50 it shares with the next one, is um, Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport, or acronym these days, RED-S. So what does that mean? Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport. It means that you're eating fewer calories than what you um, burn while you're doing your sport on a long-term basis. So it's not a fact of you doing it once or twice, but it's you're constantly under eating, not taking enough calories for what you've just used up when you exercised. Why is this an issue? Well, because your body takes that as a signal that there's not enough food available and that you're starving. So then it starts to prioritize the functions that it reckons is really crucial for um, survival. So if you fall into this category, things that you may see change is it can affect your immune system, your bone health, which is important for us here, um, your reproductive system, that's why females can see their menstruation cycle disappear or become really weird. Um, it can affect your heart health, it can affect your muscle function. So it's a really, really important thing this. Um, an example of a sport where you can often see this happen and they don't really observe any problems from it initially because there's no impact is cyclist. So your um, high level recreational cyclists as well as professional cyclists, um, these days it's quite well reported that they are prone to osteoporosis and poor bone health. And that's because when you cycle, the lighter you are, the faster you can cycle in theory. And they chronically under eat. They try to get the body weight really, really, really down. But you pay for it through your other systems. So it's not recommended to do on a long-term basis. Same thing for guys who are, um, who, who are very long distance athletes. The lighter they are, technically the faster they can run. So they tend to fall in that category as well. Um, endurance athletes like Ironman athletes, they can easily fall into that category as well. So if you do a high volume of training, you have to make sure that you look at your nutrition and you replenish everything that you burn through your exercise. Um, and interestingly enough, because when I was reading up about this, what happens if you under eat? So say for instance, you're trying to, you're training for weight loss. So you, you decided to heavily restrict your diet while increasing your, your exercise to lose weight. That doesn't actually work because again, what the body does is it goes, Ooh, we're going to starve. We're not getting enough food because we're not replenishing everything we're using. So then it drops your metabolic rate when you add rest. So in the end, you don't actually end, you don't lose that much weight because now whenever you're not doing anything and just sitting around, the body's metabolic rate is really low. So for weight loss, restricting your diet and upping your exercise is really not the best way to go. Okay, now the second really important point, and these, the first one and this one are the main things I would check and make sure you do right if you don't want to get a stress fracture. This is your vitamin D intake or your vitamin D levels. Now vitamin D is a, hormo uh, a vitamin that you need to be able to absorb calcium and phosphorus that are the main building blocks for, for bone. So if you don't have um, enough vitamin D in your body, you cannot observe, um, absorb that. Vitamin D is also really important for immune system, muscle function, muscle health. So it is not just for bones. Lack of vitamin D has been linked to osteoporosis and is a main cause for, uh, cause for that. Now, the problem is you mainly get vitamin D from sunshine when it reacts, um, when it comes onto your skin. You can't really get enough through diet alone. Problem is we don't really see the sun these days anymore. 
because we tend to live indoors, we tend to work indoors, we tend to play indoors. Also, most countries that um, are further away from the equator don't get strong enough sunshine, especially during the winter times, to give you enough UV rays, to give you enough vitamin D. So like for instance, the UK in the winter doesn't see enough strong enough sunshine. So even if it, the sun does shine, it's not producing enough vitamin D for you. Also, if you're wearing factor 50 or so sunblock or you cover up when you go into the sun, you're not really getting your vitamin D then. Um, so what I would suggest is if you've had a previous stress fracture or you're worried about getting one, um, have your vitamin D levels checked, but not just in the summertime, also in the wintertime to see how your body reacts and how um, your levels look. If you have a feeling that yours are going to be low in any case because you're mostly indoors or you maybe whenever you're outside you just train in the early hours of the morning or later in the afternoon taking vitamin d supplement can be maybe useful for you good then the next one is training volumes so what the research is currently showing is that if you run more than 32 kilometers a week you may be at an increased risk of stress fractures now Think about it, there are loads of people who don't get stress fractures, who train a lot more than 32 kilometers a week. So what this means to me is that the higher training volumes you have, the more you have to look after your body and give it the right nutrition, so don't under eat, give it enough recovery time, give it enough rest, all of those things become more and more important. So just doing the high volume of training in itself isn't bad for you, it just means you've got to really look after your body through doing all the other things right. Um, so the next one I was quite surprised at, biomechanics, because you often see people say that, oh, if you've got tight hip this or anterior tilt that, you may, you're at higher risk of stress fractures. Actually, the research is not showing that yet. There's very little research available on this topic. And the studies that, that are available used very small sample sizes, like five athletes. So you can't really definitively say from that research. This is not to say that biomechanics can't have an influence, but at the moment, there's nothing with strong evidence behind it. So I would suggest look at the, your nutrition, vitamin D and training, vol um, how you manage your training recovery and things before you worry about biomechanics. Contraceptive pill. There was some suggestions that maybe being on the contraceptive pill could affect hormone levels in females and therefore may predispose them to stress fractures. Research is showing no, that's not the case. What they do caution is against is that you can't, if you're on the contraceptive pill, you can't see from your menstruation cycle whether you are at risk of um, red S syndrome because being on the pill keeps your menstruation cycle regular. Now, if you've got red S syndrome where you under eat constantly, your menstruation cycle may stop, but the pill will keep it constant. So just be aware of that, that you can't look at menstruation as a sign of under eating or um, bone health if you're using the pill. Um, genetics is a risk factor for stress fractures because your genetics can predispose you to poor bone health um, and osteoporosis. So what I would suggest is if you have anybody in the family your close family who suffers from osteoporosis or who's had stress fractures in the past, it may be worth having your bone density checked um, to identify any issues early on that you can make changes in your diet and vitamin D levels and stuff to see if it can change. Females are also more uh, predisposed to stress fractures than males, but there's nothing you can do about that really. Then lastly, the one that for most injuries always comes up top as a risk factor is the fact that if you've had a stress fracture previously in your life, you're more likely to get one again later on. This does not in my book um, mean that it's inevitable that you will get more stress fractures. I think the reason for that, the main reason for that is either you, you've got a genetic predisposition or more likely, you've not actually addressed the reason why you got the first one in the first place. So, like with all injuries, it's so important that if, you've get, if you get a stress fracture, you have to understand why you got it. So they have to test your vitamin D levels. 
you have to look at your bone density because if you look at your bone density in your body um, and you have bone density issues in other places than just where the stress fracture is that's a sign that the whole body system is suffering for some reason so then you also want to look at um, your nutrition what's going on why is your bone density not as it should be so yes history of, of previous stress fracture is a massive risk factor to get one in the future but i think it's because people don't actually test properly and understand fully why they got the first one and then they continue to make the same training mistakes and things into the future excellent let me know if you've got any questions and if you need more help with an injury you're always welcome to consult me via video call link is in the description of this video take care